Uh, so I'd like to just give you an introduction about myself. It's not an opportunity to toot my own horn, but just to give you uh, an insight to uh, what the experience I had is this way. Uh, you know that it's coming from something that's just not anecdotal. All right, so I served uh, six years in the United States Marine Corps, which I'm very proud of. I served a combat tour in Iraq uh, in 2003 for the invasion. And then when I came home, I had a decision to make. At the time, I had went to officer cannon school in the Marine Corps, of which I'm proud I won on a grad. Uh, thank you. And uh, so at the time, the police department had called me. I had taken the test in 1999. So the test is good for five years, so my time was running out. So when I came home from my uh, from my rat, I had an opportunity to get commissioned as a lieutenant and stay in the Marine Corps or become an NYPD police officer. So at the time, I figured I spent six years in the Marine Corps. I had an opportunity to serve my country. So I said, let me try something new and reinvent myself. So blindly, I went into the police department. I, now, for me, it's not a deity. I don't have any family members prior to myself serving in the police department. And you see that a lot in the police department. That's not to change. But where it's a deity, you know, someone served their father, their father, their father, their cousins, and, you know, real family or in the type of a, type of a job. Um, but with the amount of diversity that we have, it's really starting to change. Uh, and it's changed for the better. Absolutely, I agree. So, uh, January in 2004, I went to the police academy for the New York City Police Department. So here I am, 18 and a half years later, serving the police department. I hold the rank of Lieutenant Special Assignment. Um, I ran the uh, anti-crime teams for many years. If you guys are familiarized with that, that's the controversial plainclothes teams that you that were disbanded in June of 2020. Anyone familiarized with the anti-crime teams? The What's that? Like the teams? Well. These actually, the anti-crime teams were actually uh, implemented in the early 70s. And it was a plain clothes operation. And you would see most of the cops in the summertime in cargo shirts, uh, shorts and t-shirts, and with gun belts and things like that. So th that's the operation I ran. And the, uh, the main mission of an anti-crime police officer was to get illegal firearms off the street, all right? And also prevent robberies, uh, Major felonies, that was the ideology of plainclothes units. Uh, and after the controversy with the George Floyd case, and uh, most of the complaints were coming uh, from these type, this type of policing, the commissioner decided to disband all the plainclothes operations. So there are still some plainclothes operations, but more on casework. So you don't see the, the uh, we used to call them the jump out boys. You ever see the cars pull up and you see a couple of the cops jump out of the car and play clothes and stop people. That's what, that's what anti-crime was. So now we have a new mayor, and uh, you see he's been uh, talking about a new blueprint for policing, and they're trying to implement an anti-gun team. So it's not going to be anti-crime in plain clothes. These will be uniform police officers who have experience on how to identify and get illegal firearms off the street. Uh, so, uh, like I said, uh, I'm a lieutenant with the police department. I also uh, did a, some amateur boxing uh, through my time. I hold a blue belt in uh, Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu. I, I did a lot of Krav Maga here. Uh, Sahi and myself have trained together in the park several times, just having fun. Uh, you know, I really enjoy martial arts, and, uh, and it's really helped me throughout my career. Uh, I, I, I can really feel uh, how the experience in combat sports and also self-defense programs and martial arts programs. And I know you guys know the difference have helped me throughout my career, especially in the new buzzword, which everybody probably hears, is de-escalation. Everybody knows what de-escalation is? I can tell you right now, I have over 18 years, I still don't know what it is. <laughs> Nobody actually ever tells you what de-escalation is. They just tell you de-escalate. And this is probably one of the toughest things that we find in policing. De-escalate to what point? You know, in most cases, I would say that we have a pretty good outcome of de-escalating. And, and I, I would say for the majority, 
de-escalation, the perception of what de-escalation is, is to either bring someone in custody or to settle a dispute without any physical engagement. Right? And all parties leave without any injuries like that. And for the most part, I believe that is the perception with the escalation is. I, in my opinion, from my experience, the escalation could be as far as actually having to engage someone physically, but being able to take them down with uh, as minimal damage as possible. Um, so with that being said, I'd like to just talk about uh, what's going on in the city right now. And I assume that everyone here feels it. Or at least you know someone that has been uh, affected by it. Or you've watched something on the news. And obviously that is uh, the rate of crime that we're experiencing right now. Right? And uh, has anybody here felt it themselves? Anybody see it? Yeah? Okay. Well, what, what do you see that's different right now from the past couple of years, I would say, where most part we were bragging about New York City being one of the safest cities in the country. Which yeah. race yeah. is Eric, Eric did yeah, Eric, Okay, Eric, um, I'm Lloyd. Eric, um, I'm a lifelong New Yorker. For the time being, to give you just an example, I have to continue taking the subway. Now, the subways have always had troublemakers, and there has always been a level of violence in the subway, but it seems like, in a sense, and I'm not putting anybody down. People, they have their own, um, you know, situations in life, but I'm seeing, you know, more apparently homeless people who seem to be apparently mentally ill. Absolutely. 100%. And I agree with you. Absolutely, that is one of the major contributing, contributing and aggravating factors to the crime rate that holds right now. Absolutely. Homeless and mentally ill. And sometimes they're intertwined. Uh, what else is something that you're seeing that... Absolutely. Brazenness. Brazenness. It's a okay. fearlessness born of the political situation, knowing that no matter what happens, there's no punishment at the end of the road. Excellent. You guys are actually feeding right into what I want to talk about. I, I really appreciate it. Anybody else? There's a shooting on the end of my block, um, and there's been a couple of them, and that never happened before. So, you know, during this period of COVID, I think people took the opportunity to go a little wilder with the crime, and, and it's out in the open, the drug dealing is right out in the open. I called the police, I filmed these guys, and uh, and they were away for a while, but during COVID, they all came back and it escalated. There's a lot of frustration and anger, um, maybe because people are you know, stuck inside their houses more, or, that, or at least that was the case, but it is definitely spiked up. It's not something you, you saw in, in my like, two or three blocks. Uh, absolutely. Uh, right now, for the period of February... Yeah, he has two, a question, too. Right. Hate-based hate, hate violence. Mm -hmm. I'm sorry? Uh, hate-based violence. I live in Chinatown. And oh, what kind of violence? I'm sorry? Hate-based. Oh, hate. hate. Uh, ethnic, Bias. ethnic, and religious-based. Uh, I live in Chinatown, and I live a few blocks away from where Christina Yuna Lee was murdered. Um, friends of mine in the Hasidic community are afraid. My, my family are Orthodox Jews. And I'm terrified of my nephew going to school now, wearing his uh, uh, garment sleeve, cap in the uh, straight seat. Like, I'm actually, a friend of mine who bought me a Star of David necklace, I don't feel comfortable wearing it. Excellent. I, all, all these components that you guys mentioned are definitely factors. A, a couple, several weeks ago, there was a, a, a man who said, I'm God. Pushed the lady at 11, uh, 11 o'clock in the morning, 10.43, stuck in my head in front of the entrance. We saw him the day before. We were at that station waiting for the R train. And he said, I'm God, I'm God. And he was obviously out of it, making, a, and everyone was like on their cell phone. No one was noticing. I said, this guy's, you know, and he was all over the place. The train came, he got in this station. I told my husband, let's go here. And he was wild that he was there. And the next morning, he shot the young woman in front of the train, the end train. Yes. And we asked, he was there the day before. Why was he there? Well, that's some of the things I want to talk about. And I, I, all these components that everyone here mentions is exactly what's happening right now. So none of this is fictitious, and none of this is made up, or even just news-driven. This is exactly what is happening right now. 
And what are some of the contributing factors are a lot, a lot of people want to put blame on COVID, and I think that's where it lies into politics. Uh, obviously, we're at the point where, you know, whatever your political beliefs are, but I find ironic that in a matter of 19 seconds, COVID was pretty much gone. I mean, two days ago, we all had the opportunity to watch a state of the union address where no one had any masks. And the day prior, you hear about how masks save lives. Now, I don't want to go too much into the politics of that, but, you know, we all have to have our eyes open. And I have to be honest, we'll, what, what's going on here? What's really the underlying reason? But some of the major factors that I can tell you what's affecting crime out there is law. Now, crime has always been a pedestal. It's been up, it's been down, and crime is affected by politics, and it's affected by law. Now, whatever your beliefs are, some people are pro-police, you could be anti-police, but what we should all be is pro-safety. And I can tell you this, from doing police work for almost 20 years, 18 and a half years, the police are important on the street, and we do need the police. We all need the police. Even for people that are anti-police, uh, we, we need them. It's a major factor. But some of the laws that have been changed that have really affected us is the bail reform. Has anybody heard about the bail reform? Mm -hmm. You heard about, okay. Does anybody know exactly what the bail reform is? You could get away with it. Well, in, in some way. So prior to the bail reform, the bail reform was enacted in Ju uh, January of 2000. And I say it's the perfect storm because in March we hit the lockdown. So we had COVID, which was another layer on top of this bail reform. So prior to the bail reform of January of 2020, if you were arrested, right, there were only certain crimes that you would be entitled to what's called a desk appearance ticket. It means you get arrested, you get printed, you're taken to custody, and that day you're released, you don't go to court, and you would get what's called a ticket to reappear at court on another date. But this was for low-level crimes. And then certain low-level crimes, you would be released on cash bail. And what that means, what is cash bail? Basically, it's, it's a sum of money, which is considered collateral, saying that based on this money that's been held with a bondman, right, at court, that you will return back to court. Now, that was for low-level crimes. Now, what happened is, there are cases where there have been young men uh, that didn't really belong in jail. They were actually innocent of the crime that was alleged. And they sat in jail for a year, two years, because they could not afford cash bail. So, I can understand how the city council went all the way up to Albany in decision making as far as well, maybe we need to make a turnaround with this, right? But the problem is, when they had meetings discussing and how to go about this cash bail, or how to move forward with bail reform, there was never any police experts allowed at these meetings. So the city council, uh, with the politicians all the way up to Albany, implemented this bail reform without any insight from the police department. And Why, that, is that? Why is that? Well, I, obviously we could all, I, I would say, my theory is, you know, if they did get police insight, it would never make it as far as it did. So with that, there, it's a major factor. So in most, most cases, if someone is arrested, they'll appear at court uh, and they'll get, a date to they'll get a date to return. Which means they're getting out. Not on bail, they're getting released on their own recognizance. Everybody knows what that means? Right? So you're getting released and you're coming back. So what happens is we're also letting out some felony predicate, uh, with some violent predicate felons. All right? And in some ways, you ask me, it's bad for the perpetrator as well as bad for us. And the reason why I say that is because just like our kids, all right? Most of us have children. If your child does something and disobeys and you don't correct it, they're going to do it again. Are they not? Well, it's the same thing with a perpetrator. All right? If they commit a crime and they're released, all right, the odds are they're going to commit it again. 
And why? In many factors, some of these uh, perpetrators, these persons of interest, these subjects that are out committing crime, don't have the means or the education or mentally stable to seek employment. So what are they left to do? Continue a crime spree. And, and the reason why I say it's bad for them as well is if they are released and there's no consequences, there's no adverse consequences, until the time that they appear back in court, they're going to repeatedly commit, uh, commit these crimes until they go back. Now, when, it, So if you committed one robbery, now by the time you get back and you've committed five and six robberies, now you're facing a full sentence. How do we rehabilitate someone like this? And, and the problem with that is you hear these politicians talk about different ideologies on how to curb crime. And you'll hear them talk about bringing people in and making these arrests, which sound great. But no one's talking about putting these people in jail. All you hear them talk about is closing down Rikers. But where are we going to put these people? Unfortunately, the reality is right, to, we put them back on the street. But to be safe, some people have to spend time in jail. Now, that's a, that's a whole other animal. If they want to start spending money on resources and social services at the jails, that should be done. But we have to get these people off the street. Now, the second contributing factor that I think is a, is a major problem is raise the age. Anybody know about the raise the age law? No. Okay, so prior to raise the age, that was another law that was enacted in 2020. So... The way the law used to hold is that if you are 16 and older and you commit a crime, you would be held liable as an adult. Okay? So if you're 15 years old and you, you uh, allegedly, you're arrested for a shooting, you would go to juvenile court, which is actually at the family court, and it's handled much differently. But at the age of 16, you would be treated as an adult. So... Now, with the raise the age, 16 and 17 is now considered a juvenile. So if they commit a shooting, they're going to family court. So you're not held liable as an adult until you're 18. So that is a major problem. And what we're seeing, especially from my side, of doing anti-crime police work, is and what I, do, what I do, especially where I work, I work in the South Bronx, and I work in housing. And... Uh, in my area particularly, we have most of our crimes are facilitated and associated with gangs and crews. So what these gangs and crews, what they implement is that they have the 16 and 17 year olds do the dirty work because there's not much liability on them. Now they're held as, as juveniles. Uh, so these are some of the factors that are happening. The other factors as well, um, anybody aware of the Civilian Complaint Review Board? Okay, that's another thing. Okay. Now, the Civilian Complaint Review Board was uh, administered in 1992, and it came out under uh, David Dinkins. And the ideology was that if a police officer had an encounter, it could be an arrest, whatever the type of encounter, and uh, the civilian felt that they were not treated fairly, or maybe there was too much force, or the police officer's discourtesy, it was an opportunity for them to make a complaint, and it would be a teaching moment a teaching moment either for the police officer or for the civilian that was dealing with the police officer. But what has happened over the years is the Civilian Complaint Review Board has expanded and they've gotten funded and they've gotten, uh, and, and I'm going to say this, they have an a anti-police rhetoric uh, ideology be, behind this particular organization. Um, and what happens, and I'll tell you myself, to be honest, I have... 30 complaints, and I own them. And I'm not, uh, I'm not going to uh, say, well, uh, you know, I, sh I should have no complaints. Uh, in, in, my type of, in my line of work, when you're out there and you're doing aggressive police work, proactive police work, trying to stop people from having illegal firearms, preventing the next shooting, preventing the next robbery, it's a byproduct. And I will tell you this, out of my 30 complaints, Approximately 20 of those complainants are in custody. They're in jail. I can tell you this, I've never had a complaint from just a, a bystander or uh, just someone waiting for the bus. Every complaint I have has been from someone I have arrested. Uh, so just to give you an ideology. So what happens is the police themselves, and I'll tell you myself, 
don't feel supported. Uh, you feel handcuffed. And, and it feels like a lose-lose situation every time you go to work. You know, if I move left, I could get suspended. If I move right, I could get department uh, uh, administrative discipline. And if I do certain things, I could be arrested. Now, there was also a, another law that was implemented. And this was post-George Floyd. Is anybody aware of the diaphragm law? Okay. So... Well, it's great. So here's the problem, okay? The law was written very vague. So is anybody here a medical doctor? No? So this is the issue that we're having. So the way the law was written is that if a police officer takes someone into custody, they cannot put any pressure on the diaphragm, right, or on the back of a subject to bring them in custody. And you guys train here, I'm assuming three to four times a week, right? Have you ever tried to do anything where you had to control another person and not put any pressure on the diaphragm or the back? It's a daunting task. It's probably, and I've, I've heard Sahi say this, I personally have, I've heard him say this, to control another human being is probably one of the hardest things you could ever do. Don't you always say that? Always say so that. imagine you're trying to arrest a subject or a perpetrator or a subject and you cannot put any pressure on their back or their diaphragm. And or the diaphragm, what's that? Yeah, or the neck. You can't or the neck. neck right? Now the problem is, what is the diaphragm? So the diaphragm has never been specifically lined up. Like I said, I'm not a medical doctor. So this, been, this has been open to interpretation. The diaphragm is not just the neck. It can be portions of the abdomen. It can be portions of your lower stomach. It can be portions of your back, your neck. So we all had to take part in uh, an additional training. And unfortunately, in one day's worth of training what is what we were given to figure out how to hold down a, 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 an aggressive subject without putting any pressure on their diaphragm or their back. And I can tell you right now, it's extremely difficult. It was difficult already to bring someone into custody uh, without putting any pressure. As they, now the other thing we have also, uh, everyone, whatever your opinions are, uh, I, I don't, I, you know, I, I, it doesn't matter if you agree or disagree, but the point is, it's just another layer stripped away from resources and tools that the police department has had to be intrusive keep the streets safe. And that was the marijuana law that was enacted. So now that marijuana is legal, right, for some, they say, whether you agree with it or disagree with it, that's not the point. But what it did do, it changed the levels of intrusion for a police officer. Now, particularly in the unit that I, I run, we get a lot of illegal firearms out of cars. And the reason why is there was case law. A Supreme Court judge said, if a police officer pulls over a car, it smells marijuana. Just the smell of it. You don't have to see it, view it, or see anyone smoking. But just the scent of it in a car would give us the right to search any persons inside that vehicle and also the car. Now that in itself, marijuana in itself, is a minor, it was a minor violation, right? But it was an excellent pretextual tool to get an illegal firearm off the street. So now that we don't have that tool, it gives perpetrators another opportunity to secrete an illegal firearm in a car. And you probably see it more on the news now, drive-bys and shootings from cars. So obviously, every time that, that my, myself and my units would grab an illegal firearm off the street, there's thousands that we miss. That's the reality. However, if you are uh, engaged in illegal crime, but you know that your buddy got arrested the day prior in his car with a legal firearm, right? And going back with the way the laws were, and didn't get out in cash bail, had to stay in jail, and because of the way the laws were and the politics that you're facing up to three years in jail for a legal firearm, you would think twice. So. That's why I want to just give you some insight. These are some of the factors that are 
that have led to, and I'm not saying lead to, they have led to the rise of crime. So it's important that when it comes time to vote for certain laws that you take the opportunity to do some research and vote, things like that, and actually protest what some of these laws are. Because the laws, unfortunately, affect the good people of this city, which are you and myself. You know, I, I live here myself in the city. So if you, you can see how these laws in itself may not be a problem, but when you start to compound them, compound them we have extra layers that protect our perpetrators and our subjects. And it's hurting the, the people in the street. Now, the other issue is the mentally ill and the homeless, right? And I say, unfortunately, did anyone read the article in the paper about that poor young Asian woman that was stalked in the, uh, the young black male, he was mentally ill, got into the apartment, you know her? It was a sad story, it was terrible. But he got into the apartment, he killed her, all right? Um, but did anybody actually read the article? I read the article. And I, I like to read these, these articles because I like to dissect how they're written. And if anybody read this article, at no point was this particular perpetrator in this savage animal, I'm sorry, he is a savage animal for what he did to her. At no point was he ever referred to as mentally ill. Only homeless. Because a lot of the politicians don't want to talk about that. The reality is that this person is mentally ill and homeless. And unfortunately, yes, we can't arrest ourselves out of every situation. But in certain cases, this person needs to be arrested for low-level crimes that he has committed in the past. And he did not belong on the street. So that goes into uh, what I'd like to talk about. Before we start going to some more policing, and we'll get into some practical stuff. But the reason why you guys are here, and I assume, right, this is a self-defense program, right? And I, it would be great, unfortunately, if that poor woman had the opportunity to take part in something like this. Maybe it would have saved her life. I'm a firm believer that it would. Does anybody know the difference between a combat sport, a self-defense program, martial arts? I'm sure Sahih has probably explained in the past, but you guys know the difference? Yeah, I'll, I'll make it short. Um, a combat sport like... Um Judo, um, karate, karate in our time today, um, even um, you know mixed martial arts. It's tough and one can get hurt, but there are rules and regulations in combat sport. Um, in judo, um, yes, you can choke somebody out, um, you know, in um, competitions, but um, in um, in you know pure sport judo, you can't do a coat of gas on somebody and break their arm. You have to go to jujitsu for that. And even their rules and regulations. In self-defense, there are no rules. No rules whatsoever. Combat sport, it's tough. Wrestling, boxing, rules and regulations. In um, um, a martial, in a, how can I say, street self-defense? I mean, we're here to take care of each other, but um, basically, out on the street, no rules at all. Okay. I, I, I agree with some of the ideology that you're saying, but, uh, go ahead. I would say it's mindset. My goal in a combat sport is to score points. My goal in a street self-defense is to get home alive. I think, I think you're hitting the nail on the head for pretty much. I would say it, it go ahead, I'm sorry. It's more of your level of someone of your gender, your height, your size, your weight. In the, in, the, in the street, actually, there's no matching. It's like someone much bigger, much sure. stronger. Well, yes. He also Yes. I mean, he was yes. ready. He was. He was ready to, to go and kill. I mean, so. Well, so what are you getting here? I believe the majority of it. I know that you do have. Uh, I know that you've been doing some sparring and things like that, which is fantastic. But the majority of this is based on self-defense. It's about survival, right? In a combat sport, whether it's judo, karate, jujitsu, whatever the case is. But in a combat sport, for instance, you watch. We all like to watch UFC and things like that, right? You have two, uh, two athletes who have to agree. One person is on one side of the cage. The other person is on the other side of the cage. And at some point, the ref says it's go time. They meet and they compete, right? And that is a combat sport that, or of whatever particular martial art that they practice in. But what makes a self-defense program different, and if this is uh, my opinion and based on my experience, and a lot of this applies for policing as well, 
In a self-defense program, you're learning about survival. There is no cage, there is no time, right? And there is no mats, okay? You have to deal with a life situation. And in a self-defense situation, it may not actually be hands-on, right? A, a, a self-defense move or whatever the case may be that you maneuver could just be actions that you take to, for you to survive, right? And which, which is why I'm saying in this particular program, you learn boxing, but you also learn clinching and ground fighting, right? Now the reality is, and the, the reason why it's important to understand self-defense, if in most cases, I would say probably 99.9 .9 out of 100, an actual fight is avoidable, right? Usually, like I said, in a combat sport, two people meet on the si uh, separate sides of the cage, or you meet here to spar, you're in agreement, it's go time, and we spar, right? But in a self-defense situation, if someone wants to fight with you, all right, usually there's some type of pretextual, uh, there's something that preludes to it. It could be two people get close, uh, there is some chest pe uh, pecking, there's some chest pumping, usually some people, there's some rubbing of the neck, right? There are signs that lead up to an encounter. And in most cases, these are, the actual fight itself is avoidable, right? And that's the beauty. So you learn boxing and things like that. You learn distance. Now, it's so important that you learn your boxing and you learn the groundwork. Because the reason being, the reality is if someone does put their hands up and want to fight with you, you have the option to run away, right? And ultimately, if you did run away and you didn't fight, that's a self-defense survival tactic. You won. In that case, you won. Right? The goal should be to go home and survive safely. And now, I say it's important for self-defense in today's day where crime is on the rise. The most important tool that you have right now is your situational awareness. And I hope that you guys are present. Your boxing, your clinch fighting, all these things are very important. But the most important tool that you have is situational awareness. And it's my firm belief that if that young lady had participated in a program like such, especially this one, she'd probably be alive today. And um, I was talking about this with Sahi on the phone. Now, I don't want to do any victim blaming, but there is a part that you have to take responsibility and accounting, accountability for yourself to keep yourself safe. And the same stuff I'm talking about now is what I teach my police officers when they're out in the street to identify problems, issues, right, that may lead to someone being in possession of an illegal firearm. Now, in a situational, does everybody know what situational awareness is? I'm sure you do, right? And what we're seeing right now, we see, we have, uh, we have a lot of trends. What we're seeing right now is we get a lot of victims because their heads are buried in their cell phones. Uh, they wear the iPods. We have a lot of victims because they're distracted from the iPods. Uh, they're not really paying attention. Uh, so these are probably the most important factors, okay, is the positions that you put yourself in that could avoid, avoid a potential encounter. Now, in this case, a lot of times what we find also that is, uh, is a leading factor to someone being a victim of an attack is people are afraid to not be polite. A lot of times we find that uh, women, and men included, right, when they go into a building, they feel shy or rude to shut the door on someone that's not known to that building, right? And 99 times out of 100, we pay rent, we pay, we pay high rent, we pay all this money to live in a building or somewhere that we live, whatever your security device is to keep you safe. And a lot of times what we find is when people go home, they're shy to shut the door on someone. And that, that can lead to problems, because when you let someone inside, you don't know what you're letting in, all right? Uh, and believe it or not, it actually happened to me. Asahi goes, three years ago, I was going into my building, and uh, I was off duty. I didn't have my gun on me. Two guys were trying to get to my building. I stopped them. They pulled the knife on me. Thank God I ended up winning that fight, and, and I was safe. But my situational awareness, I knew something was wrong. So... How do you know something's wrong? 
how do you develop the skills and these, to know that something is wrong? So these are the same things I teach my police officers. Every one of you has observational skills, whether you're a police officer or not, all right? And these skills can be developed and enhanced over time. So how do you develop these observational skills? Every time that you leave work or you leave your home or even when you just come here, you may not know it, but you do it now. You form what's called a baseline of what your area of, of where you're working or where your home is, what it should look like. So that's how I teach my police officers, right? Our job is to get illegal firearms off the street, prevent robberies, shootings. How do we do that? We form a baseline. So let me give you an example. So let's say, for instance, let's say you're a police officer. And let's say it's June 25th, and I assign you to the front gate at Yankee Stadium. Okay? It's June 25th. I sign him to Yankee Stadium. He's going to work security there. Let's say it's, it's 85 degrees out, right? So immediately when you go to your post, you're going to form a baseline in your head of what it should look like. So if I sign you to Yankee Stadium today, if June 25th at 85 degrees, what, do you, what would you expect to see? Not a hoodie or a heavy cloak. Know, something, a bag that looks too full or but too much clothes. So that would draw your attention. Yes, sir. Right? Absolutely. What is something that you would expect to see? Shorts. Shorts. What else? Like clothing. What else? Drink. What are some behavioral indicators you may see? Okay, what else? What about your kids, your family? Excellent. Who you're with? What? A certain level of comfort and enjoyment. There you go. So, if, for instance, if I'm a police officer, right, and they sign me today to 161st Street, I'm at the front gate of the Yankee Stadium, okay, I should expect to see, especially on June 25th at 85 degrees, I'm going to see people in shorts, t-shirts, facing the game, talking about the game, laughing with each other, right, in groups, um, smiling, like you said, sweating, shows that they've been there for some time. Um, and also, uh, they should appear to be comfortable. They should be facing the game, maybe drinking beers. But, like you said, if I see three people walking together, and they all have hoodies on, and they have straight, long faces, right? Now, does that mean I'm going to stop that particular person at that moment? No, not necessarily. My attention would be drawn to them. Mm -hmm. I would start making my observations on these three individuals, right? Because three people wearing hoodies, right? It could be that they happen to be from a hot climate. They're used to it, right? And they're comfortable, and they're just not interested in the game, mm -hmm. right? Or it could be three people that are secreting firearms, and they're looking to be active shooters, right? Mm -hmm. So these are observational skills that you, you develop over time that get enhanced by forming a baseline of what you see out there. So that's, that's how police officers prevent crime, is by cr cr uh, creating and understanding the baseline of their community. Whichever community that you guys live in, the baseline of your community is going to look different from the Upper West Side, from the Lower East Side, to maybe parts of Brooklyn, right? And that's where the controversy comes in when you see on the news about the perception that the police are racist, okay? Now, the, I work in the South Bronx, okay? So where I work, it's the poorest congressional district in the country, okay? Uh, it's a lot of housing, public housing buildings. There are a lot of bodegas, um, and there are a lot of uh, clinics. There's a lot of courthouses. So I know the baseline of the way it should appear on a daily basis. So if something sticks out from that, it's going to be like a sore throat, and it will draw my attention. Okay? It's the same thing. Whatever community you're in, you'll know the baseline of what you're, you know. You may not say it to yourself. But subconsciously, these things do go through your mind of what your area should look like. Because I'm sure of many times that you guys have walked home or you're in your car and you may saw something that was out of place and caught your attention. Or you got the hair you know, started to go up and you felt uncomfortable. These are instincts that you should act on. Um, let's talk about another, another thing of, about situational awareness and about self-defense. Um, so, we also notice a lot of times when people engage into 
uh, you know, these, these chest peckings, these encounters that may lead to a fight. What makes that different from a combat sport is that in these cases, you have to be ready and aggressive. Uh, and unfortunately, in a self-defense situation, what we find is that sometimes that you have to ultimately become the aggressor to protect yourself. And, and sometimes it's also just your body language. So some, you might have ever found yourself on a subway traveling, and there's maybe four or five different people gathered around, and you can tell that they're just up to no good. Have we ever been on a subway and there's groups of people who said, these guys are up to no good, right? Mm -hmm. You don't want to engage them. And sometimes what happens is you're on a subway, and what these people are waiting for is for you to enter their world. Meaning at some point you lock eyes with them, you enter their world, and now they start to taunt you, right? Because they want you to enter your world. So what is a good self-defense situation in that? Is not to make eye contact with these people. And if you do, just nod, look away, right? You want to appear confident, but not overconfident. And you want to appear passive, but not meek. So this, mm -hmm. these, these are tough things to really uh, feel. So how do you do that? Also, if you're in a situation where you're uh, up close with someone, and they, they're, maybe they're mentally ill, or uh, uh, someone that is looking to try to uh, take money from you, it's very important on how you posture yourself with an adversary. So if you're, if someone is in close proximity to you, what we, uh, you probably see this a lot with police officers. You ever see police officers when they talk to people, they hold on to their vest, mm -hmm. or they keep their hands up high as they talk? That's actually a self-defense tactic that you mm -hmm. practice or should be practicing already. And what that is, we call it an interview stance, right? And in the self-defense world, I know in many places they call it indexing. Has anybody heard of that? Right? So let me show you something. So stand up here, please. So what that means, let's say I have an adversary. Let's say you're at a bar on the case, right? And this person, all right, wants to engage with you, okay? Well, like I said, you want to appear confident, but not overconfident. You want to be passive, but not meek. Now, I know that side he teaches you, that he teaches you the... Uh, 360 defense, right? So what's important is if this person, okay, and here's the other problem with self-defense is why you have to be intelligible, is you don't know if this person actually wants to fight with you. Has anybody ever been in a situation where someone's trying to talk with you, but you really don't know if they actually want to fight with you, right? And that's what makes it different from a combat sport. We know we're in agreement, we're going to throw punches. But this person, maybe you're just trying to, uh, trying to impose their will on you, right? So we don't know if they really want to fight. Maybe they're puffing up their chest, things like that. So we don't really know what their intentions are, right? So a lot is upon you and how do you handle it. So what we teach the police officers is the same thing that you should be learning in self-defense. Is an interview stand, so, right? Now ultimately your hands, I don't know if you've ever heard this before, your hands should always be higher than the adversary. Alright? You want your hands higher and also inside their hands. In and, and what this is, and, and in some cases, uh, and sometimes they do what's called the prayer stands. Everybody hear about that? Mm -hmm. The prayer stands where you talk to someone like this. And what that does is, and, and, and right, Raj, right, uh, correct me if wrong, you probably teach this. And what that does is, it keeps you in a position that you could de-escalate, right? And it gives you the appearance that you're not aggressive, right? Because you don't want to say, oh, you, you don't want to be pointing at someone in an argument, right? Or pushing them. Because now that could escalate if you weren't sure if this is actually going to get physical, right? The ideology survival is to get out of the situation without physical engagement. That's self-defense, right? So ultimately, like I said, you'll see police officers, when they're talking to people, have their hands up in this position. A lot of them keep it on the, on the vest. And the reason being is, obviously, it just gets tiring after a while. But the hands are in a position, right, as I'm talking, hey, listen, buddy. I understand you're upset, you know, let's say I have an emotionally disturbed person, I'm trying to bring them down, you know, I understand you're upset. So ultimately I want my hands higher than theirs, right, and I want my hands inside theirs. Reason being, because if he does react, my hands up, right, and as a side teacher, 360 defense, if he does attack, my hands are in position to protect myself, all right. So you'll see police officers do it. That's the same thing what you guys should do. 
And it's not an aggressive stance, but it keeps your hands in a position that, if need be, they're ready. Okay? So some, like I said, you can do a prayer stance. Some, it's, uh, it's called an interview stance. Or indexing. And indexing is exactly that. I want my feet between his feet or her feet. I want my hands up in this position, right? And I want to appear that I'm trying to de-escalate, right? Which means bring this down. You want to bring this person down. What also helps too is if you're in a situation like that, if someone's aggressive, we teach people in the police department to talk softly, okay? If you talk softly, sometimes uh, what happens is uh, it, it, it keeps you relaxed. It relaxes your breathing. And people feel this. They sense it, okay? If they're all hyped up and you're relaxed and you're comfortable, a lot of times in itself, that brings them down. And that has helped me a lot throughout my career where I had a potential, maybe I had a sus suspect or subject that I had to arrest and he's getting crazy. Maybe he's on some substances, especially like PCP, which could be uh, wild. If anybody's ever fought with someone on PCP and I've rolled around with girls that are 100 pounds and I'm on PCP and I mean, you would think you were fighting with a 400 pound muscle guy. So, uh, like I said, these are some of the self-defense uh, things that I like to talk about. Thank you. So another thing I like to talk about also, in self-defense situations, um, a lot of people believe that the way to protect themselves is to carry weapons, right? Particularly, uh, a lot of women like to carry mace or pepper spray. So if anybody knows, it's actually legal to carry pepper spray if you carry it in the actual canister that it's appropriated for. You can carry it. It's legal. Now, what I find is it's a great tool if you train with it. Any tool that you carry that you do not train with is useless. And uh, I, I use this example. Like, so my lady, for instance, she works, uh, she manages a dental office. And at night, sometimes she closes the office and she's the last person to leave. And so she goes to a, a parking lot to get her car. And sometimes it's kind of desolate, the parking lot, it's dark. So I asked her, okay, if you are in a potential situation where someone is trying to attack you or follow you, and you need to get to that pepper spray, where is it? Anybody can guess where, where do you think that pepper spray is? Somewhere buried in a purse. It's in the bottom of her pocketbook. What's on top of it? Makeup, right? Her phone. Her keys, all her lipsticks. What's that? Well, that's a good point. Right, but that's different than being a paranoid. Right. Right. That you you don't want to cross that line of being a paranoid and always assume that something is going to happen to you. Right. But you, exactly. So you want to train. So I, I, I you know, I did a, a test with my lady. If you could stand up, and I, and I had her, you know, hold the bag. I said, okay, if I'm trying to attack you. Get to that pepper spray, you know. By the time she's trying to get to her bag and fumble through, you know, it's too late. So if anybody does want to carry, thank you so much. Sorry. If anybody does want to carry something like that, a pepper spray or something like that, or any tool, um, there are knives that are legal. Uh, if you do, I recommend you actually train. And, and we do that in the police department. Uh, we take we we have a gun belt, and I make my guys do it constantly. We'll take, the, we'll take the bullets out and we'll simulate situations and of how you, if you're in a situation where someone knocks you down, how are you going to get to your gun? You know, do you know where your cuffs are? Do you know where your pepper spray is? Do you know where your baton is? All these tools are. It's important. These things are useless unless you train with it. You have to be mindful of what is my route that I take home or take to from work, whatever the case is. Where is that weapon or tool that I have? How do I get to it? So if you want to carry it in your hand, like, like Sahi said, I think that's a step further. But if you want to carry it in your hand, I would recommend you carry the same hand every day. And you actually practice. Where is it? How would I get to it? Even be mindful of when you go to your car. Where are your keys? They should be in the same place every time. Because everyone knows this, right? When you're in a situation, and I know Sahi and Raz create the environment for you. I don't know if you guys know it, if you ever realize it, but they're creating an environment for you that if you are attacked, you're going to have that second that you freeze first, right? And now you have an opportunity to react. But when you do react, you lose your fine motor skills. Can we agree? 
you're capable of using your gross motor skills. And your gross motor skills are going to come into a play based on your training. And I'll prove it to you. It's a known fact. So years ago, police officers used to train on firearm disarming, right? And years ago in Miami, there was a police officer that disarmed the firearm from a perpetrator and handed the firearm back. Does anybody know that story? That's actually a legit story. So I know that Sahi may should put the firearm on the floor, right? And the reason being is to train you. God forbid you are in a situation and you are lucky enough to disarm someone that you don't hand it back. And probably all of us would say, I would never do that. It sounds crazy. But you are going to do what you're trained. That's 1,000% because you will lose your fine motor skills. You'll lose the ability to have cognitive thinking. And you're going to react. And your body is going to do what you've been trained to do. Right? So, uh, with that being said, uh, before we go into some practice stuff, anybody want to ask anything about police work or just about self-defense? Yeah, Eric, um, well, let me ask you this. How do you feel um, if you, um, well, how do you feel about legal gun ownership um, here in New York City? I'm not talking about um, criminal thugs, um, you know, carrying all types of weapons and, and engaging in murders, drug deal, gang banging, but how do you feel about legal gun okay. ownership? So me personally, I am uh, I'm pro firearm ownership. Uh, and like I said, I, I, for some people, uh, you may be anti or pro, whatever the case is. So I don't agree with, when the politicians talk about this pipeline of guns that are coming and we need to stop the flow so we stop the shootings. Or is there a pipeline of firearms? Yes. But I'm, I'm a firm believer that we created our own black market. In New York City, it is so difficult to get a firearm legally that you have to obtain one illegally. So what happens is, if I get a firearm in, in Florida, legally obtain one for $200, that same firearm in New York City is going to be 2000 So the markup is much higher because of the black market that we created. I can tell you this, in 18 and a half years of police experience, I have never once arresting a person who is a legal firearm owner that committed a crime with that firearm. Every arrest I have made of a person with a firearm obtain that firearm through illegal means. Either they stole the firearm or they bought it on the black market. And that, I can tell you, you may say it's anecdotal, but that is my experience in 18 and a half years. For six years, I was the sergeant of an anti-crime team and for seven years, I was a, I had been a special operations lieutenant of anti-crime teams, which are now anti-gun teams, seeking out illegal law. That is a tool, an observation tool. So I would not tell them, hey, I just saw you come out of 250 West 100th Street. I would say, hey, buddy, where are you coming from? Why am I asking where he's coming from? Because I know his next response is going to be a lie. The lie from that question now brings me to what's called a level three intrusion, which gives me the right to detain him. When do we detain someone? We detain someone because we believe they committed a crime, a penal law misdemeanor, or a felony crime, right? We, sus we suspect that the crime was committed already, or they're about to commit one. That is a stop and question, and I say possibly frisk. If we believe that they're in possession of a firearm, or some type of weapon that could hurt us or they're engaged to a violent crime gives us the right to frisk them and ultimately, if we feel a hard object, search them to retrieve a firearm. What comes after that is what everybody knows is level four, which is probable cause. Does everybody know what probable cause is? Mm -hmm. It's a cool name. You do. What is probable cause? Probable cause is the police officer's idea that, a, that they have a, re a reasonable possibility a reasonable possibility, I'm sorry, the lawyer, sorry, yes, um, that a crime, that a person is carrying a firearm or is about to commit a crime and it's to a degree that they feel that they can make an arrest. Okay, excellent. So, well, the problem, problem for us is, all right, so let's say for instance, okay, let's say problem cause means that a reasonable person would believe that you committed this crime. An arrest and conviction is something totally different. Does anybody know that there's a difference between arrest and conviction? Uh, I know you know now. Great. What's the difference? So arrest, you, you have been convicted, you just arrested, you know, you're, not, you're not found guilty, you just 
waiting to be you know tried, I guess. And then from okay, there, excellent. Can, yeah. So if you're arrested, and this is the problem. This is this is this is what I believe leads to these encounters on the street that earn that unfortunately end up fatal sometimes. All right. So the difference between being arrested and convicted is very important that people understand the dichotomy of it. All right. If someone is under arrest. They are being brought into custody to face an alleged crime at the court. Mm -hmm. An alleged crime, right? If someone is convicted, that means beyond reasonable doubt, there's no way that you couldn't commit this crime. You, in fact, did it. You were convicted. So what happens is when, when a police officer is faced with a crime in the street, an alleged crime, right? The police officer basically looking at it is, is like the FedEx mail package guy. He's the FedEx... The police officer has to bring this package to court so that you can face for this particular crime, this alleged crime, right? So if I came around the corner, let's say for instance, I work in housing, right? Let's say I, I, I get to the rooftop and, okay, let's say I get to the, uh, the rooftop, right? I get to the roof, it's dark, I put my flashlight, and boom, I see a, a person standing there next to a firearm, okay? What do I have? What is a police officer? What should you do? What's that? Make an arrest. Would a reasonable person believe that that's my gun? That I have that gun illegally? Right? A reasonable person would believe, right? So you, part, you place this person under arrest, and we bring this person to court. Now, at court is where the full investigation is done. Let's say we, we obtain video, and we find out through that video that it wasn't his gun. He just decided to go on the rooftop for a stroll. He was standing next to this illegal firearm that someone else left, and he's innocent, right? So that is the, that's the dichotomy of being arrested and convicted. So um, let's talk about police shootings. Now, what does everybody here consider to be an unarmed person? What's an unarmed person? Someone got a weapon. Someone got a weapon. So, if I had <coughs> this gun in my hand, you're a police officer, right? You turn the corner, you get a call for 911. There's a male, white, with a, a, a maroon sweatshirt and black sweatpants, and he's got a gun. You turn the corner, and I got this gun in my hand. What are you going to do? Arrest you. Arrest you. You're going to arrest me. How? You got you got guns? You got guns. Which one's the one on the left? So you, two, you, you guys are partners, all right? If you go to the doorway for me, please. All right? You guys, you're going to get to feel what it's, what it's like to be a police officer. So you guys are um, what we call in the police department, if you work in, let's say, this area here, right? This is the 2-4 precinct. Anybody know that? This is the, you should know what precinct you live in or work in or wherever you're at. In case something ever happens, this is the 2-4 precinct. So in the 2 4 precinct, we have these two fine police officers. You guys, you've been sworn in today, you two police officers. Outstanding, congratulations. They're second. <laughs> so today, they get assigned a second round. They're working in this area. They get a call. We have a, a destroyed man at 250 West 100th Street, white male, right? Wearing a maroon hoodie and a black and, and black pants. Okay? So, you guys come in, you got your radios. Hold on before you actually come in, right? Now. Okay. So, I want you to imagine just what it's like to be a police officer today. So you guys are going to come into the room. Now keep in mind, okay, uh, let's say, is there any parks over here? Let's say we're at 250 West on the Street. Let's imagine this is a park. There's people sitting on benches, right? There's people hanging out, all right? Um, if some of you, uh, some of you maybe have phones out, you're watching. So these two police officers respond, okay? And here I am, right? Someone has put over a 911 call, 
that there's a male white with a gun. Okay? Now, so I want you guys, if you want to take a couple of seconds just to think about how you approach this, I'm going to act for you when you guys, uh, you have your firearms, you can pretend you have radios, you want to communicate with each other. I, let me know when you're ready. Oh, uh, my wife, uh, all this child support is killing me over here. Oh, uh, what do you want? Uh, no, don't you guys have something better to do? I'm trying oh, to figure out exactly what's the uh, matter right now, sir. We need you, uh, I gotta pay $5,000 a month for this bitch. Who? Who? You know who? X? Big Mama? Uh, what do you want? Don't you have uh, No, go get a donut, man. You stupid shorts, man. I'm a, I'm a pizza type of guy. But, um, <laughs> this is, this is, me and my partner here, we just received a 911 call about someone who's walking around the park. You know, you know these dudes? You know these dudes? Yo, man, what's up, you good, guys? Yo, who's your rookie part over here? Get his ass out of here. Why don't you leave him alone? Here, yeah. yeah. no, I just here. Went, I just here. went to no. come back about all our business. I just went Mind to come back to the house. I'm an attorney. Are, are you harassing this board gentleman? Uh, yeah. no, 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 no. No, this cop's got nothing to do, man. Yo, what do you got, like two years on the job? How old are you? Go back to the people. Find something to do. Yeah. Come on. Find something to do. You're on video. You keep harassing me. Man, whoa. It will be. man. Leave him alone. Leave him alone. Get your own baby mom. Why don't you talk to my wife? <laughs> what? Excuse me. My name's Matthew, and your name is. You want? Oh, I don't want to give you my name. Go. Oh. That's okay. That's whoa, okay. Whoa, whoa, whoa. You trying to figure out? You trying to me? No, no, I didn't what say she say? What'd she say again? What'd she say? I say nothing. You nothing. We're just oh. trying to figure out what's going on. What do you work? What two four? I work in Brooklyn. Oh, no, I don't want to deal with you. Last time, last time I had an issue, those guys beat me up. Man, look, I still got this car. I got a lawsuit on your asses. This is bullshit, man. We're not here to beat anyone up. We're just trying to figure out what's going on. There ain't nothing going on. I'm trying to just figure out exactly. No, I'm just gonna, you know what? I'm just going to sit on this bench, all right? I'm just, just going to, you know, I'm going to be Just leave me alone. That's okay. That's okay. I'm good, man. I'm good. Mind if I sit with you? You want to sit with me? What? Yeah. What? <laughs> he don't know you. <laughs> you want to sit with me? Yes. I want to sit with you, see what's going on exactly, because, um... You know, you're getting kind of close, though. I'm going back. I'm going back. I'm going back. It's okay. Uh, again, my name is Matthew, and I'm just trying to figure out exactly, you know, what's going on. Seems to be an issue with your baby mama oh, or female. Oh, that's your business. Barbergate, what's going on? Whoa. <laughs> <laughs> no. Yo, drop the gun, drop the gun, drop the gun. Drop Ooh. the gun. Drop the gun. What's going on, David? What happened? Drop the gun. What's going on? What's going on? Come on, man. That's way too much money. Ah, he's got a gun. That's crazy. <laughs> drop the gun. Look, look, dude, I, I, I got what's going on. Put, 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 put it on the ground. Put it on the ground. I'm not going to hurt you. I'm good, man. I put it on the ground. Boom! Boom! Get out! I'm not passing this. You shot the car? I know. I shot him, though. We're good. What? 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 These calls happen all the time. All right? So, listen, I mean, do you feel any stress? I mean, this is, an environment. This is, a, it, this is just an environment. It's a match. It's a people yelling at you. You feel any stress at all? Like, I don't know. Like, you know There's a certain adrenaline rush when you go into a situation and you don't know anything, what's going to happen, so on and so forth. Right. So, this is very, uh, very typical for a police officer. So, when a police officer gets a 911 call, you have very limit, limited information, right? You have a location, and you have someone that called 911 to give a excerpt of what may be happening. Mm -hmm. So all you know is that you, you get to this park, you have a crowd of people hanging out on the bench, 
you have a description of the male with the potential firearm, right? Mm -hmm. So, I know you guys don't know police work and the laws and all, but you got a call that I potentially have a firearm and the entire time you guys engage into a, a conversation with me mm -hmm. and never try to get the firearm from me or never try to, 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 to frisk me, right? Talk about the mm -hmm. frisk, right? Don't you think it would be necessary immediately to frisk me, to try to disarm me, right? So these calls happen all the time. This happens thousands of times a year, probably a million times a year. And unfortunately, you guys only hear about the calls that go bad. This could be, this could go bad right away, okay? 87% of gunshot wounds are survivable. 87%. Did you know that? But I don't want to be that 87. I don't want that gunshot at all. Okay, but here you are, you're the police officer, you've got limited information, and you were told that I have a firearm, right? So people are out there with phones and it looks crazy. Nobody knows what's going on. But if it was me in a situation like that, sitting up, I, I'm, and I'm coming there, there's the guy, yo, let me see your hands. Let me, don't move. Uh-huh. And it's not going to be very nice. And you're, you're going to be out there with your phones, and she's going to say, I'm a lawyer, why are you harassing him? Because all you saw is this nice guy pacing around the park because he's talking about his bitch ex-wife, all the money he has to pay. He's had a bad day. Remember this. A police officer doesn't get to meet people on a good day. We get to meet people on their worst days. Good people on their worst days and bad people on their worst days. I've never had a person walk into the police department and say, hey, how you doing? I've had a great day. We only get to see people on their worst days. Yeah. Now the drive is to have psychologists on staff. Right, so that's what, right. what would a psychologist have done in that case any different than these two guys did? Well, here's the scenario, right? You guys get there. This is a guy in the park, clearly, right? The police officers do this all the time. It's a hard job. Clearly you have a guy who's distraught. He's telling you. That's why it's so important about observation skills. In this two seconds that you have, you have to make a decision about what has happened in this guy's entire life. Huh. Based on those two seconds. And what, what did you hear? I said, my wife, my wife. So right away, you know, domestic problems. Right. Mm -hmm. I gotta pay that bitch $5,000 a month. This guy's going through financial problems. What are some of the reasons that people are mostly suicidal? Financial issues, divorce. The number one reason that people go bankrupt in this country is for medical. What's number two? Divorce. So here's this guy who's going through an issue with his ex-wife and he's paying money. He's having the worst day of his life. Mm. And guess what? This is just another call for you. Is after this call, you get another one. Mm. One call is someone with a gun. The next call is you're helping a kid who got shot. The next call is an aided person unconscious. The next one is helping a young, uh, an old lady across the street, but this is the day in the life of a police officer. So here you are, and you got all these videos out, right? But nobody showed you the video of the guy talking about his wife, and with, all they saw was the police officer aggressively walking with a gun in the guy's face, right? Because if it was me, if I have you, right? Listen, honestly, I'm coming in. Hey, how you doing? How are you? Let me see your hands. How you doing, buddy? Listen, I got nothing wrong with you. Listen, so let me make sure you got nothing on you. Right, in other cases, right? Um, I usually have them be, be with a partner. So if I'm with a partner, I'll have the gun on him, hold check, whatever the case is. You know, so these are crazy situations. And it only takes two seconds, and I'll show you. So you, even without any police training, you were stuck. Drop the gun, drop the gun, drop the gun. Most people are stuck. You probably say drop the gun 50 times, right? Because the reality is you're saying, well, but the gun is like this, right? So let me show you something, right? Who wants to hold this gun? Anybody? Me. Right? Okay. So, your police officer, right? Stand outside, please. Sure. Okay? And I'm a bad guy, all right? So now, we're going to start like this, okay? I'm a bad guy with a gun. Okay? And she's the police officer. And on the count of three, I want you to tell me who's one. You ready? Anybody can count? One. 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 Bang! <laughs> <laughs> I'm a 
small woman. I you are very small. Let's try again. Ready? All right, ready? One, One two, two. Drop the gun! Three. All right. What, she's dead. She's dead. What? Hit. Excellent. She's actually really smart because you've been paying attention. So, the reality is, an unarmed person yeah. is exactly that. There's nothing on them, nothing in their hands. All right? So, these are very tough situations. And the reason why I say it's who won, the reality is, all it takes uh, is less than eighth of a second to point that fire round down and pull the trigger. And if you were the police officer who that just went to work today and you got shot and you survived, you didn't win anything. The goal is not to be shot. So, you know, if I say who won, you know, and that's the case, most people are going to say, drop the gun, drop the gun, drop the gun, because you don't want to be on video, right? This, this opens to public opinion. And what's become more important than police protocol or law is public opinion, right? Public mm. opinion is going to be, I shot the guy who's got his firearm like this. Is that person on arm? No. All it takes is two seconds. Right. But, and there's a shot fired. Go ahead. When you are pointing your gun to your face, should then uh, one of us have shot you? Like, would that would have been the opportune time? Well, this is a great situation I wanted to get in. It's a lose-lose situation. You, uh, that is a lose-lose situation for every police officer. Right? Mm -hmm. The goal, obviously, in that situation, first, which you guys, and I understand, you know, as a police officer, first thing, what would you want to do? The first thing we try to do is get cover. Now, in a big park, that may not be possible. Maybe I could get covered by a tree, right? So, um. How good shot the ambulance? Like, he's the only one here besides you who actually, like, knows what to do. So, how would he answer this? A question about the rules of engagement. Right, so I, 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 I my, my rule, the way I know it, it's military, right, and it's, uh, it's not in an urban space with civilians, it's just not with friendly civilians. Mm -hmm. So we're in the military, we're allowed to shoot 60 degrees up. Of, of course, here I, I understand that you, know, you shoot 60 degrees from a window, so I mean, perhaps you can go mm -hmm. up, but like, mm -hmm. having the first shot as a warning shot Excellent. before you aim. Excellent. Police officers, every police department has their own laws according to the jurisdiction. New York City police officers are not allowed to fire warning shots. Hmm. All right? So. That's why that. What's that? That, that creates yeah, a, a sense of a... I agree. Seriously. Right? You're not allowed to fire any warning shots. And real quickly, yeah. aren't, aren't warning shots expressly forbidden throughout the United States? Due What's to that? the Supreme Court case? With that, no police officer in this country well, there are some, there's supposed to use a warning shot. There are some police departments, in like rural areas, that allow for it, you know, to someone's assistance. Maybe they're in a situation where their radio is down, they have nobody to get any backup other than by firing a shot and someone can hear it. You have to assume, based on your radio call, that the situation is as bad as it can be. Absolutely. So every time that you get, it, yeah. what what about these new weapons, as they call them, which are the tasers, which don't seem to work all the time, Excellent. and this this, Excellent. this lasso gun that. Rocks them around with a lasso. So, right. Well, that's the problem. So the public has had this opinion where they want police officers to use tasers most of the time. Mm -hmm. I don't want to put the taser up against a firearm. Uh, mm -hmm. I wouldn't want to bring a, a, a knife to a gunfight. Um, so what I, and I'll tell you, I can say this. So, yes, you can't fire any warning shots. Every time a police officer goes to a call, every call is a gun call. Every call a police officer goes to is a gun call. You may be saying, what the hell do you mean? Why is that? Can anybody think why is that? Always assume someone has a gun. No. I know you don't know. Come on. You know this one? Because you have a gun? Exactly. The police officer is bringing a gun to the scene. So every call is a gun call. And believe me, there's no... Miraculously, it's a tool, it's equipment like any else. These gun belts, things have gone wrong, they have they fall out, you don't hear about these things, or people get into a tussle and the person manages to pull on the firearm and the firearm comes out and it's someone else's gun. So every call is a gun call. That is 100% true. Now, yes, in every situation, that's where it's tough and you find a dichotomy. Do you want to go to every call, you know, heightened and uh, aggressive? No, 
But that's where the observation skill is coming. In a second, you have already have a picture painted for you that potentially you have someone with a full description who's in possession of a firearm. We have to make sure that that person is unarmed or get them unarmed before we engage them. What's, what do you think of, I believe they're, so, they're talking about police officers being, uh, coming with social work or what? Oh, here's what talking about that. I, 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 think, I think it's silly and laughable, you know? <laughs> Listen, they, they, there was a study done in 1999 called the Dunning and Kruger effect. Anybody ever heard of it? Yeah, you don't you know what you're Exactly. You don't know what you don't know. And the least amount of information that you know about a subject, the more that you can think you can do it, right? Everybody knows all these Facebook warriors. Everybody knows the, the big fat guy that watches uh, uh, a football game on the couch, drinks a beer, and goes, ah, oh, man, why didn't you throw the pass to him? Why didn't you do this? It looks so easy until you're in the game, right? Until you're actually doing it. It's the same thing with policing, right? And we're going to do this at the end. I always love to do this at the end. But who thinks it's ridiculous? When eight people try to handcuff one person, does anybody think it's ridiculous? No. no? I think it's a lack of training. It's not ridiculous. How many people do you think you should take to cuff someone? It should be two people to cuff someone. No, one person. Five. One person. How about five? Really impossible. Five. Okay. Yeah. Five. okay. On drugs, it could be it. Well, five people. But it should take two. It's not even that. So, you know, Blue Dot interrogations. It's on YouTube. It's cops and their real situations. There's, there's, a guy in a, in a Walmart, oh, they had TVs, like high expensive items in the cart with, with the receipt on the phone, and they already knew that this was a, a grip. So they this guy had the gun on him? The guy that had the gun on him? He had a uh, gun on him, yeah, right? yeah, he had okay. a gun on him, yeah. Uh, and he had a knife on him, uh, but, but they looked, they were middle-aged, you know, a couple, man, woman, so, you know, on, on, on first look, it was, you know, they gave him the benefit of the doubt, and the store said, we just wanted to get them out of here, so, you know, eject them. Uh, they weren't going to charge them. They said, we're just going to walk out and, and let you go. And they said, but, you know, I'm just going to take your name. And then they see the knife on him. And they said, put your hand on that. Things got way escalated. And this guy was not in good shape. He was like a middle age, he's overweight. And uh, four cops and the bystander could not get him uh, to the ground because he was wrestling and they couldn't cuff him. And, and then, surprise, surprise, he had a gun on him. And he got it out. And they had to shoot him. Well, I tell you what, it could take. In the past, before the diaphragm law, well, it could take eight, it could take ten people, it could take twelve cops, depending on the cases. Now with the diaphragm law, well, it's it's made even more challenging. Here's the problem: the perpetrator has zero rules. The perpetrator has no rules. The per it's like the lion in the lamp, right? The perpetrator just wants to survive, does not want to go back to jail, okay? And this person has the will to fight, right, to survive. You, as the police officer, have rules, you have a pension to protect, and you also have to look good for public opinion. What do we have? Cameras everywhere. Cell phones. Body-worn camera. Dashboard cameras. So. Agitators. Agitators. You have it all. Okay? And you're not trying to hurt this person. Eric, can I ask a question? So if, if we are, as bystanders, deciding to help a policeman at work, can we apply pressure on them all? Yes. There's no way you can control someone without controlling them. That is a hundred percent right. Actually, yeah, the, so a, a, a civilian uh, is held to di uh, mm. is held to different standards. A civilian can apply pressure. If a police officer applies any pressure pressure to the windpipe area, the police officer uh, can be arrested himself. If the police officer applies pressure to the diaphragm, the police officer can be arrested. So sometimes they do show leniency based on how volatile it is. But yes, the civilian is held to a different standard. The civilian can apply pressure. He's and, liable. But he's liable. Uh, you're right. In a self-defense situation, you're helping a police officer. You're liable by uh, interpretation, right? If, if the person stops fighting and you're still choking them, then you can be held liable. So obviously, too. There's a lot of ways to to oh, hold someone's neck without choking. I can't even I can't even be on camera with my hand anywhere near the neck. Right. And it's just open for too much interpretation. How much, how much training do you get for this? Because it seems like you know how much self defense training and restraint. Well, I can tell you, you know what I'm saying, right? Uh, police officers definitely do not get enough training. In most cases, right? I myself have taken pride in boxing, in jiu jitsu, in karate, and in training throughout my career. In addition to being in a very aggressive hands-on unit, I've had to actually 
uh, had hands-on practicality, where I've had my training applied and I've actually had the experience of doing it. But in most cases, it really comes out to funding. And mo most police officers, police officers do not get enough training. I can tell you, think about this. Most police officers never get into, uh, never actually have to remove their firearm and actually pull the trigger. But yet, police officers have to qualify at the gun range twice a year. Hmm. Yet police officers get into tussles constantly and there's no, uh, there's no qualifier at all throughout the year. And in hmm. most cases, the only self-defense portion of training uh, or practicality they've had was in the academy or after some law come, or something happens like George Floyd. The George Floyd was, was a pinnacle moment for policing in America. After George Floyd, they were trying to come up with new ways to revamp the police department's training, but they, they came up with new training on how police officers should subdue and take people down. It was one day. Do you think if you did Krav Maga for one day, that would be enough to yeah. save your life out there? Yeah. Absolutely not. We all know, even to just to learn the jab, takes years, right? So they expect you in one day, there you go, eight hours of training. You know what? It just comes out to funding and liability. Sign this paperwork, you're trained. You know, Lieutenant did, you're trained, something happens, they sue you, all right, now you're held liable. And why you can understand why some police officers are apprehensive to be aggressive, because if yeah. they take that action, right, now they're held liable, right? Oh, Lieutenant Tim, in 2005, was trained on this. Yeah, I've been trained, trained on you know, in 15 years. Police officers, 100%, I agree, need more training. We could always use more training, right? The ability for survival out there is being pressure tested, right? Society does it with you constantly. And then when you do the warm up, when you do the warm up and you're running around, you're crossing through the lines, that's about the thought of war. That's preparing you, right, for a volatile situation. Constantly being pressure tested. When society makes you close your eyes and you're being attacked, you have to open your eyes. That's to simulate you're in a situation where you're being attacked. And you have that moment where you freeze and now you have to respond. But if you train for one day, you're not going to respond. And the police officers are yet are expected to make split second decisions based on an inadequate amount of training. And that's the reality. Right. And I will tell you this, NYPD officers are probably the best you're going to see in the country. And it's not because of the training yet. The byproduct of is it, the byproduct, and I say, from my experience, is because it's such a volume of city, and in such a metropolis that we live in, a city of almost nine million people, we get so many calls, we encounter it with, with people every day, constantly. So we're getting hands on training. Where some police officer who may be in some rural town or suburban area doesn't have those interactions constantly, so where they need that training. Does that make any sense? Yeah. Uh, yeah. So, but understand the situation like this. You go into the park and you have a male of the scripture with a firearm, and he's pointing that firearm to his head. You're in a lose lose situation. Mm -hmm. It's all on camera, right? Why did the police officer shoot him in the leg? Why did anybody think anybody does anybody know? Does anyone does anybody think that you can shoot somebody in the leg or the arm? That that's has anybody ever shot a firearm? Yeah, exactly. Okay, mm. you shot a firearm just once. And, and, and how do you feel? Um. It's hard to explain the first time. It's so, just once, it's just, if you have no control, it's so fast, so immediate. So imagine you're chasing someone, your heart is pounding, you're in a stressful situation, you're cornered, you chase the guy, you're cornered into an apartment, right? Mm -hmm. And now you have to fire a shot. Well, you're firing a shot in a crowd of people at a park. Mm -hmm. Yep. Where do police officers shoot? You know? Set a mask. Set a mask, great. Set a mask of what? Of the chest. Two shots. Visible area. Very good. So you said center mass of the chest. Yeah. We shoot center mass of the target that is presented. The target that is presented. Because if I have, you know, if those police officers entered the park and I was by the tree, right? And I just pop my head out like this, how are you gonna shoot me in the chest? And yes, I know it's a grim reality, nobody wants to hear, but if I only pop my head out and I have a gun, you're gonna shoot center mass of my head. Mm -hmm. Why do we shoot center mass of the target presented? Why? It's the largest target. Largest target. Why do we want the largest tar target presented? Incapacitation. No. More than that. To prevent missing so you don't hit somebody else. Exactly. To prevent missing so you don't hit somebody else. Now, if you're running and you're doing all this crazy stuff and your heart's pounding, 
So the public, you hear these people, these council, uh, these city council people, some of them have, you know, this anti-police rhetoric um, sentiment to them. You'll hear, oh, why, why can't the police all shoot in the arm and shoot in the leg? That's it. I, you know, under duress, if you miss, guess what? That bullet has to find a hole. Mm -hmm. And it's usually a person, is right? There, there's no safe place to shoot a person, is there? If I shoot you in the leg, I hit your femoral artery, you bleed out in seconds. Well, it, it's, it's there, no different than a headshot. Like, it, does it make it better if you die right, with a That's true. The, the, the goal of police officers is to shoot to stop the threat. When I was overseas in the Marine Corps, you shoot to kill, right? And it's probably the same thing in... Uh, Depends. We are... Oh, you also do a police. Are, yeah, we have liable for almost everything, right? And everything becomes like an international incident, right? So we are uh, trained first to shoot in the air, first to verbalize like that stop, stop or shoot, but give them the chance to stop, um, then shoot 60 degrees up, because we usually fight open field, and then shoot to their knees, and then shoot to the center of mass if they don't stop. Unless there is a more immediate threat, so then if there is immediate threat, you look for the center of mass right away. Um, but there is uh, there is no easy way out there. Uh, so uh, uh, for the police law purposes, we shoot to stop the threat, right? Mm -hmm. So that means that if you have to, it, right? It's not like the movies where you may shoot someone and they go down. The reality is, in most cases, when people are, when their adrenaline is up in volatile situations. Most people don't even know that they're shot right away. Mm. And they can't continue to fight. They can continue to fight, proven people have been stabbed, and most people don't even know they're stabbed until mm. afterwards, and uh, the dust is settled. So people can continue to fight. And you shoot until that threat is obviously dead, terminated? Yes, and if, you, if you'll see, if you've ever watched any YouTube videos, uh, police officers get into police involved shootings, when the person is shot and down, they will go and handcuff the subject. The person still gets handcuffed. Mm -hmm. That's if they go deceased or not. This is the grim reality. Even so if they're dead? What's that? Even if they're dead. Even if they're dead, yeah. Yep. We'll go cuff them. It's just it's Just, just in case. Just in case he's not. Yep. Well, so it's unfortunate. It's a grim reality. But with these body cameras, all right, unfor what we're finding is that we had organizations that didn't want the body cameras because it's showing the reality. If we all had a camera in everybody's bathroom and bedroom, we wouldn't want to see it. We all know what goes on in everyone's bathroom, and we all know what goes on in everyone's bedroom, but we don't want to see it. It's the same thing now that we have the body cameras and the phones. Now you get to see the grim reality. And unfortunately, a lot of times you'll say, well, why did the police officers do that? Why did they hit the guy so many times? But they give you an excerpt of what happened, and they just give you an illusion. Okay? They don't show you what happened before and what happened afterwards. And yes, sometimes people can be in handcuffs and still be a threat. You guys do ground fighting here, right? Mm -hmm. Why do police officers <coughs> take someone to the ground? That's control. control. Well, if you take someone to the ground, it's about control, right? If I have you on the ground, right? Instead of controlling someone who's six foot tall, now I control someone who's three foot tall. And with the ground, it allows me to have more control on this person. The idea is control, subdue, and arrest, right? But if someone's standing, right, you still, it, and it's hard to see sometimes these body cameras, you still can apply a lot of pressure. I can still kick, I can spit, and that's what happens a lot. And sometimes on these videos, and that's why I think these body cameras are great to protect police officers from major incidents, but not minor ones. You know, if I'm driving a, a female suspect in my car, and I have a body camera, and nine days later, she says I raped her. Clearly, that body camera is going to exonerate me and prove my innocence. Right? That's a major incident. But when I have a body camera and I'm in a tussle, it sometimes it's hard to explain. You guys, when you, because you train and you're in a clinch or you're doing some sparring, and if you watch someone else do it, you have a great understanding. But someone who's never engaged to a fight before may watch it and not understand what's happening. And why are the police officers hitting the person that way? Why are they doing this, right? And it's an ugly scene. The bottom line is, it's ugly. It never looks pretty. I don't care if you're the, the most experienced high level martial artist or someone with no training. Placing someone under arrest that is aggressively fighting is an ugly scene. It never looks pretty. It just does. And this is the grim reality. Um, where's those lasers? Yeah? Okay. How does it work? Uh, 
Okay, well. All right. Anybody want to? Anybody want to work on? All right, come on. Right. So. Okay. So. I'm going to hand you the. I'm going to get you warmed up a little bit, and then I'm going to hand you the fire on afterwards. Okay. So. These are here for now. Okay. What these are going to be. Okay. These are going. To, gonna, I'm going to have two people in here. Okay. They will be your adversaries. Okay. And you're going to have to get. To, you're going to have to shoot them. So. So. If you can do a. Uh, 50 jumping jacks, let's get your heart going. Okay. Anybody gonna get through 50 with me, please? Okay. Yeah. Alright. I think I can hold fast on there. What's that? I'm gonna hold fast. Oh, yeah? Okay, good. Are you guys doing it?
Okay, are you dead? Yeah, I'm dead. Alright. <laughs> 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 do you think I need to be from him? Let's say we're in an apartment and we get a call that I'm mostly served, right? Whatever the case is, maybe again I'm having an argument with the ex-wife, whatever the case is, I'm a mostly disturbed person, right? He comes to the apartment and unfortunately in this case he's by himself. How far do you think he needs to be from me in a safe location to retrieve his firearm to shoot me before I stand? 21 feet. 21 feet. That you know. So we teach some so we teach police officers a minimum of 21 feet. Now I want to be 21 feet from my adversary so I can get my gun out to shoot. Now, a lot of times you hear public opinion, people say, oh, you should use a taser. A taser, uh, I would not put my life on it. A taser is only good 51% of the time. Did you know that? So that's basically flipping the coin. Why? So a taser is most effective when, so when you fire a taser, there's two primes that come out of it. You guys know that? Mm -hmm. Two primes come out, right? And the ultimate goal is to get them inside the person. Now, if he's wearing a big heavy coat, right? I'm not going to be able to make contact with his skin. There's little primes that need to penetrate his skin. Now, the ultimate goal is the closer that they are, I'm sorry, the further that they are on his body, if I get one prong here and one prong here, I have more of an electric current that's going to immobilize it. But if I fire the taser, right, and the taser, and let's say I'm, the further I am with the taser, the better. But if I fire a taser and I'm close, and I get the prongs close together, then I don't have a big span of his body. And he's a big guy, that's why I pitch him, thank you. So I probably won't immobilize him. So if he has, if he had a knife and he got tasered and it was only a short distance, he's probably still going to fight. Now, if anybody knows, the side can probably tell you this. If you fight someone at night, you're getting cut. Can we agree? You are getting cut. Right? And they used to do tests in the Marine Corps. They used to paint these paint knives, these fake knives, red, with like a red dye, to see you in a sparring situation with someone at night. And every time afterwards, the other person would have red on them. The bottom line is, you will get cut, but it's a, ma it's a matter of survival, right? So, let's say he gets to the apartment, here I am, I'm an emotionally disturbed person, okay? I'm going to show you how difficult it is to be a police officer. So, unfortunately, okay, everybody knows we just had two police officers that got killed, right? Yes. Okay, so unfortunately, these two police officers were walking down a corridor where they couldn't get out. There was no way to retreat, okay? So here you are, you're in a situation where you're in a corridor, you can't get out, right? So let's do 21 feet. Minimum of 21 feet, okay? So one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15. Let's, let's do all the way here, 21 feet. So I know it sounds crazy, but the police officer to maintain safety needs to be a minimum of 21 feet to be safe. Now, he doesn't have a gun belt on him, but we're just gonna try to simulate him. So, on the count of three, I'm gonna give him an opportunity. He's stuck in the hallway. He's gotta get to that gun and shoot me before I get to him. Now, if we're in an apartment, it's highly doubtful that I'm gonna be able to get 21 feet. So, what would we say this is about? 15 or so, okay. So. On the count of three, I want him to have the ability to get to his firearm and shoot me before I stab him. Do you think he can do it? Yes. 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 We'll see. Yes. Would you put your life on it? If you were going to be No. All right. So let's, te let's test it. Let's try it out. All right. You ready? So who's going to count? Who can count? One, two, three. Go. Shoot. Oh. Oh. That's how scary it is. Right? So, now the reality is, he didn't have a gun belt. On a gun belt, it's a lot harder. So, that's why we teach the police a minimum of 21 feet. Because even though he got, uh, if this was reality, I would say he probably got a shot off, he still got sick. You want to go to work and get sick? No. 
And so I'll show you how we teach police officers in a situation like that. So how we do teach the police is if you have a gun and you are in the face of someone with a knife, you basically, what the police officers are trained to do is to try to gain distance. You don't have a distance. And how you do that is by retrieving the firearm and backpedaling. That's how police officers do it, to try to gain distance. So no, you may not have the opportunity to uh, pull a taser, have a non-reliant taser, and you also have to hit your adversary with this firearm, which is why we point for center mass of the target. Presented. Presented, that's right. So if the head is presented, that's what you're going for. You're going for the head. You All right. Would, you wouldn't approach a situation like that with the gun drawn. So, uh, uh, that's excellent. I'm glad that you did that. Thank you so much, Thank you. So, that's excellent that you did So, all right, so, every situation is different. Look, I mean, here's a call of a concert in a park, just loud noise, and your job was just to go there, respond, and just make an observation skill on what's wrong. And you guys immediately saw that she and I looked like we were having uh, an argument by body gesture. And the reason why I wanted to show you that is because you have to, as a police officer, rely on senses. Your observation skills may not always be in your ears. You may not have the opportunity. Some situations are, like, in some situations that we go to, can't hear anything. Some, you can't see anything. Right? Someone may have a firearm, and I go into a situation like this. Right? So, like I said, so the last thing I like to do when I talk to people about police work is test the theory. So George Floyd is the, is, was the big, pinnacle moment for policing in the country, right? And how do these things happen? That people put knees on people's necks, their backs, and things like that? These things happen because it's ugly. It's very hard to control somebody. So let me get some big people here. You, who else? Excellent. Excellent. Good, good on camera. Excellent. Excellent. Okay. I need another one. It's not big. Little bit. <laughs> okay. All right. So, you guys are all, listen, I'm under arrest. I'm your suspect. I just committed a robbery. Okay? Now, again, we're in the park. Okay? Everyone here is watching them make a arrest. They make an arrest. Please. Just don't throw any punches because we don't want it to look ugly for the camera. What I'm going to do is I'm going to put my hands like this, what many people do. Okay? You're the office? I'm, I'm a perk. Oh. You guys have to try to get my hands behind my back. You can tackle me. You can take me down. Just don't throw any punches. People don't like the punches, right? Don't throw any punches. Don't use weapons. But you can take me down and try to get my hands behind my back. All right? Uh, we'll give you a minute and a half on the clock. A police officer, don't get a clock. All you gotta do is try to get my hands behind my back and simulate that I was gonna be handcuffed. Can I get anybody over here to film it? The whole film. Okay. So, before you say on the side, can you guys, anybody have any phones? Nothing. Paul, the guys, while they're trying to make an arrest. So, while these guys are trying to make the arrest, what I need you guys to do is to be an audience like you see out there. Yo, leave them alone! All right, really get in their faces. Why are you bothering them? And they have it all the time. We'll be arrested. We'll be people leaning on you to be like, yo, what are you doing, man? Yo, suck my dick. <laughs> I'm sorry, that's just real. This is what they say. Do you want me to tell them, Just, just I'm saying, I want you to get in their faces. All right? All right? So, uh, let me know when you're ready. I'm going to take some. 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 No, do the double leg take down. You guys can't punch. Do the double leg take down. All right. Okay. Okay. You get yeah, two to start on this side, two to start on this side, and on the clock, go! 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 Hey, get off of us! Come on, man! Get off of us! Come on, man! Leave him alone! Come on, man! Leave him alone! Leave him alone! Come on, man! 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 Leave him al
90 seconds, go on. What's that? 90 seconds, good. Oh, nice. Yeah. All right, that's good. <laughs>